Good morning, this is Michael Hassett, and we will bring you a new history program called The Past Awake. And this is our inaugural show, so we'd like to welcome you all. And my fellow host here is Pat Barry. And we'd like to welcome Pat Barry on. Good Friday. morning, Michael. Good morning, Pat. How are you this morning? I'm very well. It's, we have two Michaels. We have one behind you, and you're talking to me. It's appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> correct, correct. Behind me, you will see uh, the great Michael Collins, the unsung king, a leader of Ireland, as many called him, the great what if. What would the Ireland be like post-22 had he had lived? And there's many great what ifs. Or well, if this what did happen, and how he's great life was cut short at the age of 32 and the 22nd of August 1922 at 6 minutes to 8 p.m. Uh, where the course of Irish history was changed and hopefully over the next hour myself and Pat who is a cockman from Michael Collins's home county we will look at different antidotes the different uh, versions of story there's they, they reckon there's 12 different sides to some of these stories, but we will look at some of them today. All we have is the facts that we know, but there is also so many warships and unsolved mysteries, because there is still a great mystery yes. around his state. There's still a bit of mystique around his, his state, which we will look at later. So, any... But Michael, and indeed, I suppose... Yes, that one. Go yeah, on. I suppose myself... Growing up, I've, I'm, I'm older than you, so therefore, when history was taught to me going to school, it stopped at 1916. And, of course, uh, these events that we're referring to is what happened afterwards, after 1916. And, of course, Michael, Michael Collins himself, as we know, was in the GPO in 1916, and he joined hundreds of others in the camps over in over in Wales, Fongoch, after the after the slaughter of the of the signatures of the proclamation by the British Empire, and uh, of course they continued to make huge mistakes, whatever they were, and this was one huge mistake they made in executing the signatures of the proclamation. And over in Fongoch in um, Wales, Michael, I suppose, found his position, if you like. They used conduct an awful lot of their meetings, Oskrelga, so that, you know, people wouldn't be going back with, because there was a lot of spies in that camp, as you know yourself, you know. So, for intelligence point of view, that's where he cut his teeth, really, Michael himself, was, I think, anyway. Said, Some Michael, people have different debates what, about it. But. What Michael Collins really became known for, and what gave him the age over his uh, fellow comrades in the we call it the growing Republican movement at the time. It started off as Irish Volunteers, which was a pretty open organization on the streets. But post-1916, it, it became, to say, persecuted by the British military. And they rebranded in 1917 and 18. But he really seemed to have focused in and learned from the mistakes and learned from the mistakes of our previous uprisings, where he said the key to this is intelligence. Secretary, and that also led to yes. he getting involved in the IRB. It was kind of like the circle within the circle, of the IRB being the Irish Free Republican Brotherhood. So you had literally the Irish Volunteers, the Irish mm. Republican Brotherhood. By this stage, the Irish Citizen Army was being moved out. It became more of an all embracing. Republican movement with a very Republican tone to it, rather than aspirations towards military home rule. We now wanted the whole hog. And intelligence was his key. Exactly, but if we... he was renowned for was basically anyone that suspect of being a spy, take him out. That, was, that became his... And before we come and to that gun. aspect... Yeah, go on, Pat, yeah. And exactly, but prior, to, just to go back to where, how he came about, his dad, his own father, Michael John Collins, of course, was connected with the 1848 
uh, movement in Ireland. So he had a, he had a, 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 a huge background. And, and his own dad, of course, as we know, did not get married till he was 60 years of age. There was a match made from then at 60 years of age. And Michael came along of the youngest of eight children. Fair play to him, eight children. And Michael, of course, being the youngest, and uh, and uh, he was 76, uh, Michael's dad, when Michael was born. And uh, he was, he passed away shortly before Michael's seventh birthday. And uh, that he's, his dad and his mother... Mother never remarried, of course, down there, and um, they had, I think, they had 90 acres or something like that of a holding down in Woodfield outside Clannacilty. For people who haven't been familiar with it, you can look it up anyway. But Michael was always precocious, was always um, keen on learning, learning, and find inquisitive, an inquisitive mind, and he eventually did the exam for the British, for the civil service, for the post office. And uh, he got a job over in London where he moved in with his sister, his older sister, living in London at the age of 16, I think it was, yeah, 15, yeah, 16. Yeah. And then he immersed himself in all things Gaelic in London. And so he, he got to, to know at a, a very peripheral level. Yeah, he got, the, he got to know at a peripheral level in the beginning the ins and outs of the civil service, how it functioned at a basic level you know <laughs> so that was all drawn on later on obviously as we know but um he met the wonderful he mixed with sam mcguire who we right. know uh, was from dunmanway as well and who gives his name to the the all ireland cup today and uh, he was a uh, um, um, sam mcguire of course came from protestant stock as they say but that didn't deter his his uh patriotism for the mm-hmm. cause if you like if you know what i mean but Michael, of course, as you said, Michael, he um, was in the GPO. And then, of course, they got an amnesty, the prisoners, and they were left out, you know? In 1917. Of Frangok. It Was it 1918? Have uh, somewhere in 17, yeah. but the last came out in 1918. And, um, for a couple of months. And then there was a lot of agitation decided to to go the full hog for to get our freedom really to establish an independent republic and so everybody put their shoulder to the wheel De Valera, Collins, Griffith the whole lot, full on, we, full court we, press as we'll just pause you there now and we um, we'll, we'll just pause you, there was a very significant event in 1917 the British government uh, brought out conscription and conscription was to be imposed in England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. Now, while there was not much resistance in England, Scotland, yep. Wales, uh, it was resisted very much in Ireland. So there was a big surge yep. towards to support Irish volunteers in Sinn Féin, because Sinn Féin and Irish volunteers were taught against conscription. And there was, in every parish throughout Ireland, there could be up to 200 men marching up and down fields on Sunday morning joining the volunteers because those volunteers as i said earlier was an open organization from 1913 onwards up to the dawn of 1916 uprising <clears throat> basically um 90 percent of the volunteers decided to follow redmond join the british army mainly under the uh, to go off to fight in world war one under the tint division the tint and the, I think it was the 26th was the second one, those two Irish divisions and the, the 16th division, one of them being made from the UBF, those volunteer force in Northern Ireland, and Ulster at, at the time, Northern Ireland didn't exist at the time. And yeah. basically they, it was a huge surge in support of the volunteers until conscription was going to be imposed on us. Well, the British government decided that it was literally backfiring them and they decided not to impose the conscription in Ireland by the end of 1917, which was seen as another Sinn Féin victory. And basically overnight, I used to yes. hear my uh, local historians in my own parish saying there was one field in my own home parish back home in Maru, County Limerick. And basically it went from 200 down to about 15 overnight. 
So that hard core was still there. And that hard core went on to be the nucleus or the basis of what went on to be the IRA from 1919 onwards. Whereas the other uh, people who were there marching during the conscription, they just faded away. So they were not willing yeah. to go out and fight in the trenches and die for a cause or war they felt was not theirs. So that didn't lead to a major contribution That's true. In, and then, in building the organization, the structure, and particularly the structure on the ground. Call it the cells, the units, the battalions that were later to go on to form the flying columns and all of that. That was a major instance that we don't really factor in, but was led to huge organization skill at the same time. And of course, Michael was renowned for his organization and skills in... Uh, and getting people to follow him here, there's ignat this magic about him that could literally draw people like a magnet to him and get people to do what he wanted them to do. And you know, Michael, I think um, uh, a lot of the younger, very, very younger generation, I think the first real exposure they got to Michael Collins's character was captured somewhat in the 1992 film where Liam Neeson played him in the film. I think that captured some of the personality, not all of it, but obviously because it's just one film. It's a shame there hasn't been more, more in-depth films made about his, all the other skills he had as a human being as well, you know? Yes, yes, yes. I, um, I do agree. And, it was a great movie. Yeah, and in a, to us, and also, of course, you know, Brendan Gleeson played him in the in the series that was shown on RT, do you remember that? It's called a decent, just three or four part series. Yeah, very good. Actually, yeah. I think that was the best um, version of Collins. I think he really did establish the real Michael Collins, like that split personality where he he, he was a politician, a rogue, a local guy, one of your mates. And the next thing, he was the most wanted man, as well as being a politician on the national and international stage. He rolled all of these different personalities all in, in, into one. I think he really just got it right. Plus, it, it, it also helped that he did actually look like him, and he was able to build up him more so than Liam Neeson in the Hollywood blockbuster. And of course, yeah, he yes, he yeah, they were both, they were both played him. It, it also showed up the very close relationship the, uh, with uh, Arthur Griffith. But Arthur Griffith was a huge influence on his life. Yes. A huge in, influence. While Arthur Griffith was more oh, activist, he was, he was. A politician, they worked well together. They did. And Arthur, I don't want to say kept him in check, but kept him grounded. That's a better yeah, word exactly. than anything else. And Arthur Griffith, I think he's much... Yeah, you're right, Michael. I, th I think he's a, a little bit forgotten in Irish history as well, Arthur Griffith, okay. because a tremendous, a tremendous figure, respected on both sides of the, the aisle, as they say, you know? Very yeah, well regarded, very well respected. Very about, so yeah. they're... But he's very sad about Arthur Griffith. He wrote so much. He wrote so much and so little of that writing is available to the Irish public today. One of the great, he was actually a great supporter of the, what was a huge movement at the time in rural areas of Ireland, and is literally has died a death in the last 20, 30 years, is the cooperative movement. Because Collins and Griffith had this idea yes. of liberation, post freedom, of having. Um, very much an equal island for everybody, equal opportunities. They were ahead of their time, really decades ahead in their thinking. Uh, rather than having that extreme left-wing Bolshevik view of the state owned everything versus the extreme right-wing of the, the wealthy merchant class, the upper privatization class owning everything, they came with a very forward thinking where the people own their own local businesses, their, their local creameries, their local shops, but they actually own it as shareholders, not this fictional Bolshevik view of the people own it, but really it is 
the party elite of a political party. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Where you could own your own land, would work together. And unfortunately, uh, as we know, post Civil War and um, while the remnants of Michael Collins and Arthur Griffiths party did go in, they did follow that more right wing view of business and politics. And uh, unfortunately, even the founder of the cooperative movement, uh, whose name fails me at the moment, um, yes, uh, Plunkett, uh, he unfortunately, eight years after the freedom of the state, 1929, he had to leave the country. Says a lot about the state that followed them. It, it does. Well, you see, obviously, with the prior to the civil war, prior to the, and the run up to the treaty, then um, a lot of figures, if you like, emerged around the country in different areas that Collins drew on their expertise, if you like, to agitate for the uh, for the Irish Republic to have a clean break with Britain, and uh, one of them, of course, uh, of course, an awful lot of that's why Cork. Not because I'm from Cork, but that's how it got its name in one respect. That uh, rebel, the rebel county, because a lot of um, there was a lot of very, very good leaders there, and there was seminal events there, of course, with 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 the kill Michael ambush, as you know, Michael. You know mm -hmm. that, that 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 was a seminal event in that whole era there. You know, and Tom Barry, who had um, who was in the British Army, as you know, in, in the Middle East, out in Aden, served in the British Army. That's so easy. he had knowledge of of how they operated, how the Brits operated. Right. And he used that knowledge and skill to to probably have one of the biggest killings in one day, you know, of yeah, British Guinness, auxiliaries and, and Collins, black and tans, yeah, as they were known as well. Yes, yes, that's true. That's true. So we are in 2020 and we're running up to the end of the year, of this year rather, a rather uneventful year in many respects because of the situation we found ourselves in. Okay. But uh, we're running up to the two seminal events, the, 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 the murder of Tomás McCartan right. uh, in front of his family by the RIC and Black and Tans, the first Lord Mayor of Cork, and then, of course, subsequently, the hunger strike death of Terence McSweeney right. in Cork as well, the second now mayor of Cork. So Tomás McCartan uh, has the envy, uh, I suppose, in my own case, on my mother's side of the family, there's, um, they're related to the McCartans, that's the McMahons, the O'Mahonies, and the McCartans are related on my mother's side of the family. So I have that. I always had that little thing. In the back of my head going up, I always knew more about Tomás McCartan than anybody else, you know, mm -hmm. simply because of that connection. But uh, these were heroic figures. These were real, real heroes, Irishmen. And Michael, couldn't we do with a few today? We could. And just what came to my mind there while you were talking about him, he coined a very famous phrase that has been quoted by many people in, down through the years over the last century, but very few people acknowledge who actually said it first. And that phrase was, it is not he who imposes on you that wins, but he who resists that wins. You have that phrase, Ham Hamja. Well, yeah, I do. That's, that's, I haven't heard it for a while. Yes. It but it's, I tell you, it's something that we should, yeah. I suppose, bear in mind today. I mean, the, but the hunger strike. Bear in mind today because when they write the history. Yeah, but the, 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 the hunger strike was a whole new political whip, weapon that was used during the Irish War of Independence. It was not a weapon or a way of resisting um, aggression from an outside force used in any other war. The Irish and the Irish War of Independence and Irish Republicans have tapped into this whole new philosophy of hunger strike or starving yourself to death in protests against uh, maybe the conditions that they were that have been imposed on them as prisoners of war or maybe uh, to make it as a state yeah. in international re recognition. It does go back to a very old ancient tradition going back to our pagan past 
Um, I, I researched the concept of hunger strike many years ago, and I discovered that back in the pagan, you know, Celtic, pre-Christian past, if a wrong was done to you by a member of your family or a member of your wider community, you, you actually went out and you sat in front of their house on a chair for several days with no food or hunger until that person rectified the wrong that was done to you. And this tradition was there in oh. the whole history. And it used to be practiced, but what got, kind of got written out of our recorded history. But obviously some of these guys were way of that past and way of that. Yep. They applied the same philosophy, the same log logic to literally, I'm being locked up in a prison for something I believe in strongly. I am not going to take food until I object and I want this situation rectified. And that's where the concept of the hunger strike come, come from. I only discovered three and a half years ago, my brother and of course doing research on our own family. And I realized that my grandfather was a hunger striker. And I found out about a month ago that my granduncle uh, did 46 days of hunger strike in a British prison in 1920. So I'm both a grand nephew and a grand uncle, sorry, grand nephew and a grand son of two hunger strikers myself. And it's only after realizing that, that I began to realize, you know, could I go 46 days without food? I don't think so. And what motivates you to do this? Like, I mean, it had a serious, I know yeah. it had a serious effect on both of their health later in life. They were never the same after it. Um, it did really play havoc with the personal health as their lives went on into middle age and later. Of course. And basically they were never the same after, but it takes some motivation to actually do that. Because our concept of our view of the hunger strike is the famous hunger strike of deaths in 1981, the teen hunger strike of deaths that in the Hitchblad prison in Northern Ireland. And that seems to be our only concept of hunger strike. But the hunger strike goes back a century before that. So it has been. Oh, it does. And there was, there was a huge. It does. And of, obviously, yeah. There's a huge hung, hunger strike during the Civil War by the Republican prisoners or the anti treaty forces major serious hunger strikes was used by men and women in that civil war as well, which is completely, um, I won't say completely, but very much forgotten by the historians. And please God, when we come to the anniversary in two to three years time, that it will be explored um, fairly and openly without... Well, it'll, yeah, yeah, it'll be given, it should be given, a, a, yeah, you're right. It should be given a prominent position because, I mean, as you were speaking there about hunger strike, the of course Gandhi uh, operated uh, in that way as well. Yeah. Mahatma Gandhi yeah. in yeah. the resistance of the British Empire in he India. So he was he was in that tradition. Yeah, he was. Yeah, and now he was taking more pacifist yeah. role, um, and he was a pacifist, the ultimate pacifist, you could say. But yes, he used the. Whipping, if I may call it, the, the whipping of the hunger strike to embarrass the British authorities uh, in highlighting the injustice that they were doing to the Indian people at the time. And of course, before we, not that we should leave it, Terence McSweeney's death from hung, on hunger strike, being the Lord Mayor of Cork, I was looking it up there, it was last year, the year before. It made headlines around the world, and that was some uh, astonishing achievement when you consider the majority of people reading those newspapers, not behold, but they hardly knew where Ireland was because they assumed it was England, do you know what I mean, part of England. So yeah. this act yeah, yeah, of, yeah. Hero this heroic act by Terence McSweeney did as much as taking out the G-men, should I say, or anything like that, in highlighting the plight of the Irish throughout the world, which was unbelievable. Yeah, but you know, I, I of course, his funeral was astonishing. You have, astonishing. To in, you have to factor in one point here. He was just not any ordinary hunger striker. He was a democratic no. Lord Mayor. He wasn't yeah. a self-imposed Lord Mayor. He was democratically elected through 
open elections under British rule at the time. And he took a stand. Yeah. And the next thing, I mean, they believed that he wasn't the hunger striker. The, the hunger striker killed him. They believe it was the forced feeding that choked him to death. Some say that that is what caused his premature death. And the same, you was really... Well, uh, I... At the very same time, in England, at the time, you had this suffragette move, movement that was going on. The women were trying to get the right to vote yeah. in England. And a lot of those women went on hunger strike yeah. and were being forced fit as well. So it was a normal policy. It, you know, just be, and to give... It did. To be fair to both sides, to the British, they were not just treating us differently. They were treating... All hunger strikers, male, female, British, Irish, suffragette, Republican, they treated them the same. They were not going to stand by idle in their point of view and allow these people to show yeah. to the whole media of the world at the time. So you've got to factor that side in here as well. And of course, if I may say, and so the, the, the struggle content, yeah. the 1919 election came about. Uh, sorry, the 1918 election, it was 1919 before they actually, uh, the first door set in January. But the 1918 election, uh, yeah. Ireland was the first country in the world to um, elect a female representative to his parliament. Even though the parliament was not yet recognized by the world or the British, we were. Yeah, we were. So we were progressive in that sense where we were given equal rights we to were. female which was really uh, being... Well, Michael, Michael Collins, Michael Collins, yeah, Michael Collins has many female spies in his group yeah, as males, yeah, is yeah. many female spies as well, Michael Collins himself, and trusted, trusted aides all around him, uh, passing information, as such. So he, they were, they were forward-looking, you're right there, Michael, they were very forward-looking, and that was a clean sweep for Sinn Féin in 1990 when they met in the Dáil. I think it was Michael appointed Minister for Finance in that doll? Yeah, Minister for Finance yes. in 1990. Well, and uh, I don't know, I was very disappointed last year. Yeah, I was very disappointed last year that there wasn't a lot more made of that event, you know? Very, very, very disappointed, you know? That I there wasn't agree. a lot more I made mean, of uh, the first doll in 1919. That's unfortunately where we are 100 years later. We have a lot of what they call revision history um while it's always good to keep looking and analyzing history um we should never try to rewrite it it is what it is um uh, but we are we are trying to put different it is on it for different agendas you've got to realize that whatever we think of them they did their best they were doing the best they could of with limited resources at the time and they were, I suppose to use a word that's very used, most used today, progressive and out in their outlook and thinking at the time. Um, we can see later how a lot of that was taken back in the early governments that was formed in what was going to be called the new free state and that. But there were certain aspects of the celebrations last year, like now, uh, trying to celebrate um, pacified the whole area around the black and tans and the RIC and we were not really focusing on other areas I think where we should have more focused on that does leave and did leave uh, sour taste in the mouth of many people as we saw um, where those well it, it was um, I thought I thought it was a monum I, I, I thought it was a monumental blunder yes it was on people well Varadkar might know best, but people like like Flanagan and them, they should know better than that. They should have been above that kind of carry on, in my opinion. They no sullied the names of many, many heroic figures in history, in my opinion. And there was no need, and there was no need for it at all, you know. Yeah. But the agitation, we it is often said that we bombed and killed our way to the negotiating table. But could anybody in history tell me, was there any other way? Well, that's a very good point now that you're bringing up, because uh, if we go back to the main players in the world of independence, I uh, go back even a, step, a little bit more, uh, back to 1916. Um, 
it was out of frustration of three home rule bills being rejected. There was a yes. The, the Todd and Lacey's home rule bill was passed in 1912 and was be enacted in 1914. And it was being enacted under the summer and was to kick in, I think, around September 1914. And as we know, events in Europe led to the postponement of the Home Rule Bill, um, mainly World War I. And the summer crisis developed within the British diplomatic service um, from the onset of May, June and July. So it was advised to uh, postpone the home rule conveniently for the British. Now, I really looked at that situation on the 100th anniversary back in 2014. What if there was no World War I? What would have happened? The, probably the likelihood is, if you look at the events that were leading up in 1912 and 1913, the UVF were arming them, themselves with hundreds of thousands of guns. The Irish volunteers in 1913 followed suit. The, uh, Later, we to bring in the guns into Hot Harbour. Uh, ironically, the Germans yeah. were playing both sides, which is, you could, if you want a conspiracy theorist, you could say um, the Germans were trying yeah. to fight Ireland and create a situation in Ireland well, the, to distract from Britain. Yeah. But there would have been a There's civil nothing wrong with backing, didn't backing two horses. <laughs> Correct. There would have been a, a bloody civil war of some sort. So some historians will debate World War I postponed a bloody encounter between the Eunice Protestant British tradition of Ulster versus the uh, nationalist uh, upcoming Republican Catholic supremacy of Southern Ireland. And it would have been very interesting how that would have panned out because I'm sure if the nationalist Southern side was getting the upper hand, I'm sure the British Army would have stepped in and then in the middle of that, you had the mutiny uh, in the Cora in 1914 for a senior British Army officers mutiny within the British Army at the events at the time. But again, World War I covered up all that very quickly. And it turns out it that did. all the forces and armies that was going to fight in the Civil War wound up volunteering and joining the British Army and fought side by side in World War I. And particularly that was very evident in the Battle of the Song in um, 1916, where both the 10th and the 26th Division, the 10th Division uh, was mainly, I believe, made up of the UVF and the 26th, uh, made up of the yeah. uh, Irish Volunteers. And um, they fought side by side and died side by side. And there's some great stories coming out, which I won't get into now. It's, it's another story of where they literally fought side by side and risked yeah. one another that night, including um, Redmond's brother, who was killed. And apparently, UVF, former UVF Protestant soldiers from Northern Ireland went out and rescued his body during the night and dragged, dragged it in. So, you know, it, it, it is. There you go. I mean, there's been many. Yeah, you're right, Michael. There's there's been many uh, heroic stories of that horrific war. The the it's referred to as the Great War. There was very little great about it, in my opinion. You know, I don't know why it is referred to as the Great War in 1914, 1918. Uh, it was nothing but absolutely slaughter. Slaughter, slaughter of mainly working class young lads mm. by an empire, anyway, by empires, or I should say. Anyway, so Michael and the boys and all of them agitated, and eventually, uh, of course, the British thought they could put down these little skirmishes as usual, you know. Usual, yeah. The Irish would eventually turn and run away and forget about all, yeah, forget about all of this, but. Of course, the I think the event of 1920 on that famous Sunday morning, when Michael Collins' squad took out the nearly game. all of the G-men in Dublin Castle, you know, yeah. took them out absolutely since shockwaves. I know they went into Croke Park after dinner on the same day with a with 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 tro the troops went into Croke Park 
and uh, shot a few, fired shots and shot a few people, you know, horrifically, just shot them down, which is uh, no surprise when you look at history again of the British Empire and um, being involved in many massacres in many countries throughout the world down through the years. However, this event eventually led to treaty negotiations, as you know. I just want to and make one point that you want about that massacre where they drove into Crow Park with a trusty thing and opened fire on the crowd. I mean, many people today claim 13 people got killed, but dozens were injured with sprayed bullets. It could have been hundreds. <clears throat> and I think it's around in nearly the very same time in India, a similar massacre happened, the famous um, uh, is it Amariska massacre in northern India, commissioned by the British Army as well, in very similar circumstances where they went into a stadium and machine gunned the crowd and killed hundreds of people by... Um, God only knows how many. Uh, how was his, his name? Was it Dwyer? Uh, Dyer, D-Y-E-R, Dyer, I think was his name, General Dyer. And it obviously shows this was an accepted thing to do within the higher ranks of the British Army where it was quite okay to massacre the civilian population to keep them in check. You've got to also realize there's, yep. there's another backdrop going on here and it's something I've been reassessing personally for the last year. Post-World War I, bear in mind now that the war came to an end in 1918, but at the same time, behind the scenes, you have the Treaty of Versailles is going on while the new war of independence is developing here in Ireland. And you had about 12 to 13 wars going on in Europe, totally unknown. You had uprisings in Germany, uprisings in Hungary, uprisings in Upper Silesia, modern-day Poland. Uh, in Poland, the Czech Republic was being born, the Czechs and the Poles went fighting, the Czechs and the Romanians went fighting, the Hungarians and the, Rom the Romanians went fight fighting, the, Ro the Romanians were having um, <clears throat> a kind of coup d'etat civil war, the Hungarians were tearing themselves apart between left, right and rightless. There's all these wars going on, not to mention the large scale slaughter that was going on at the very same time in the so-called Russian Civil War, which wasn't a civil war, it was civil wars within one. That's right. And there was yeah, all these right. pogroms yeah. against the Jews, against the civilians. Why it may sound completely walled away from our acceptance of uh, how military sh should fight today. It was common, it was standard, it was ordinary run of the mill everyday life uh, in certain parts of Europe where the civilian population was just mowed down with machine guns. We forget that today. We're thinking with today's perspective. Back in the day, it was a different. And they, they looked upon any people that was standing up to them. There was a view that there was somebody behind them. They may have been raised, they may have been Bolsheviks, they may have been leftists, extreme rights. All these crazy ideas going, going ahead. But how dare someone um, rise up and question the authority within their state. And yes. In this case, it was the British authority, and they had been so used to for hundreds of years. Any uprising that was here, so the case of Sindal's show of force, put it down, and we melt away. However, guerrilla warfare under Michael Collins changed all that. There's a whole new style of warfare, a style of warfare they had not been it did. and didn't know how to react to. It. No. Right, the casualty rate was low. No, they did not. It, it um, set their morale to actually fight. They were not able to deal with it. And the only way they could deal with it was lash out at the civilian population. No. In their view, that protected these people that were attacking them from behind the ditch or behind the wall or behind the cover of darkness yep. that they used to yeah. fight. There was a psychological so, force as well. Eventually, anyway, the... It was, I mean, it got, it was out in the, it it was out in the ether then. It was out. It was world news then. You see, it yeah. was out in the open, if so to speak. The the struggle here in this country, the small island of ours, because an awful lot of very good people went to America and built up some fantastic uh, contacts. But then, of course, they had to go and negotiate the treaty, and uh, 
Griffith and Collins, as we know, they all went over to negotiate the treaty. And that was the first time I think an awful lot of people in the British establishment actually physically saw Collins, you know, or even knew what he looked like (laughs) (laughs) over at the treaty negotiations. Yeah, I think this is a very, very, very important turning point in Michael Collins' life or career, whichever way you want to put it, so his career would be more apt. Uh, Up to here and up to this point, one of his strengths, and one of the strengths that Michael Collins had over the British, over his opponents, was the fact he didn't know what he looked like. He was this mystique, this enigma, this... That's uh, right mysterious figure. I mean, we don't realize today that a lot of the press in the UK at the time demonized him. But there was also an equal amount of people putting him up like a Dick Turpin type of guy, a good guy, um, in this build this in enigmatic mystique about about him. He was here, he was there, he was no he, he was nowhere, and nobody could get one single clear picture of what the guy looked like. They went down, they burnt his house, they burnt his home, they put his mother and his family out of the house. They did everything to taunt him. They literally destroyed his whole home, his family and everything. And yet, they could not get him. They had a massive price on his head. Nobody took the bait. And all of a sudden, we have a truce. Now the guys have to come out from under the cover. Yes. And Collins did not want to come out from under the cover. He wanted to use this as one of his no. his strengths, stay behind because bargaining chips. As a bargaining chip, what if the talks don't work? We have to go back fighting again and the next time they know him. However, De Valera had a complete different view. De Valera went over first, as we know, on his own. He tried to negotiate with Live George. He realized he, he actually realized that he was not going to get the ultimate 32 county republic and came back and decided to send over Michael Collins and the delegation that went over, including Arthur Griffiths. Uh, and there was a fierce yeah. row between Collins and De Valera about this. But De Valera, being the president, he had to obey the orders. And reluctantly, yeah. and very, final very, very reluctantly, uh, Collins said only out of, of obedience really did he go. But uh, Collins knew then once he came out into the open, there was no plan B. We could not go back to the plan B of hiding behind the mystique. And the amazing thing oh, was no. when, he arrived, when he arrived for the talks, the first morning when he arrived for the talks, he and the delegation expected this massive crowd outside the building that they made in Britain, which I thought was actually, in hindsight, was not a good idea to negotiate a treaty with the British on British soil. It should have been done on a third party, somewhere like France, or even do the other way around. Yes, or do it in Dial Man, or do it in even in Versailles. Because Versailles was fast. Only, was finished at the time. It should have been done there. I think it was a very uh, putting the Irish on the back foot, but that's just personal observation. Um, however, when they arrived there, there was huge media attention around these guys, and there was hundreds of British people cheering Michael Collins. It was absolutely uh, not the welcome that they expected. <laughs> and even the torches behind the doors that they were meeting well, actually be shocked and appalled, if I may, so at the reception that the Irish delegation got. It was just one of those yeah. amazing things around Michael Collins that even his enemy... It was very... It was very dis- yeah. Take one pass, one well, here. as we know, I mean, there was a, a huge... Admir- there was a huge admiration within society in Britain at the time in certain parts uh, for Michael Collins and the people uh, and people behind him because I mean on a human level of course they recognize this this uh, ideal this struggle to for self determination was a very uh, well and respected principle at the time and of course as we know about Lady Lady Lavery I think to shine to Michael some say that she fell in love with Michael 
We don't know that. We'll never know that. Some say that Michael fell in love with her. I don't know. I don't know. It's only all speculation. But nevertheless, I think the, I suppose, the standing of Michael Collins went up in an awful lot of people's estimation. But as you said, Mike, as you said, Michael, he was out in the open now. So he was a Mac man. And they went back then to the doll with the treaty. Do you know that yourself? Uh, there was many they back to the doll, the, to the doll here and wasn't well, just going, going to that. There, there was a number of issues here. Um, the Republican leadership in the last six to 12 months of the campaign before the truce, a lot of things had happened. There was a, a number of victories on the Irish side, but we keep forgetting there was one major victory by the British over the Irish, and that was a major showdown in Ashdown, where they lost 81 volunteers. They literally last night the whole Dublin Brigade of active men. And it was as a result of David yeah. Lowe coming back from America. He had been away for 18 months. He lost touch with the, the way events had been happening in Ireland. Of course, as we know, he had Harry Boland with him. Harry Boland and Michael Collins were literally like two twins. They were very close, but Collins uh, and himself grew apart. Drew yeah. apart. And he more went over to the David uh, way of thinking how to deal with this. And David Lairer then Wing. got airs and graces about himself when he was in America. Uh, he was not welcomed by the Irish-American Clan de Gwail, which was the, and the IRB within America. He was actually very much ostracized by these, these guys. And David Lairer became very much aware that there is a kind of circle within a circle, as I explained earlier, there is the DIM and there's the OSD, the, the IRB, and there is the Irish Volunteers, and then there is the, the DOL, which is the elected representatives of the country, so as to speak. And there was all these motions going on. So you had Harry Boland, you had um, and a few more guys who, had, no matter what Collins would have done, no matter what Collins would have agreed or brought home, they were not going to agree. And you you had Cahill Brewer no. and you had um, Austin Stack. They were his two major torn in the sides. And they were just, they were determined to bring him down at any cost. So when De Valera, sorry, when Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith and the other uh, seven negotiated the, the uh, treaty, you got to realize that we, the Collins had began a campaign literally before the truce of letting the British access a load of arm stumps. And the whole idea of he letting the British lead themselves to massive IRA arm stumps was to give this illusion the Irish Republican movement was highly stocked and were in for a long haul. Now, it was a complete bluff because yeah. Collins admitted later in his diary they had only about 12 days bullets left. So this truce came as a vital time for That's both all. without both sides realizing to the extent of what the other was thinking. So it was a complete game of bluff here. And it was a welcome mm -hmm. with the Irish Republican movement at the time, and Collins availed of it. Now he's sitting down at the table, now he's negotiating with his pro protractors, the, the guys who had only weeks before had a price on his head. And the Collins' attitude was, get what we can, build on it, step by step. But then yes. there's other belief then that it's all or nothing. And it was obvious there was going to be a split, but what way would it speak? Uh, uh, Collins always reckoned he could bring 80%, 80%. Yeah, but before... And basically, he did bring 80%. Yeah, but of it, arms men at the time. However, once the truth yeah. came about, there's another very, there's two very important factors you must realize what's happening during the truth here. The truth now, there's a kind of feeling the fight is over. We may not be going back fighting again. On the day of the truth, there's nothing more than 3,000 active servicemen throughout the 32 counties on the IRA side. However, on the day of the treaty, they had 70,000. So 67,000 people out there felt us now safe to come out, show their faces, 
and shine up. But yet they were not there when the chips were down and when they were hunted and hunted, and their homes burned and their families being harassed and everything. And a lot of those new 67,000 yeah. recruits uh, were the side that went anti treaty Whereas a lot of the ones that were kind of very active, and of course a lot went both ways, but the majority of them went pro treaty because they had enough of it. They realized they could get what they could get. However, there's the whole question of the two main issues in the truce. Everyone thinks it's not an when it's not. It was actually the oath of allegiance was the main sticking point in the truce. And the irony is, and we, we mentioned earlier about the home rule. What was the difference? And I remember going to a very um, renowned historian down in North a few years ago. And we were, there, was, there was a discussion about what was the difference between the treaty and the home rule. Home rule was to be agreed in 1912. Here we are nine years later sitting down with the treaty after an armed conflict. And the only difference between the home rule and yep. the treaty was we would have our own independent police force and our own independent armed force and we could collect our taxes. That's how we gained. We still had to agree, as was agreed in the home rule, six counties would work as an independent in entity within the island of Ireland under British administration. However, the British did do a very dirty trick where yeah. the previous year they brought in the Government of Ireland Act of 1920, which established the legal existence from a British point of view of Northern Ireland as a separate entity. So obviously, if you look at that from another point of view, you can realize that uh, they realized even in 1920 they were going to have to sit down with these guys and negotiate at a table. So obviously the fact they had that sit in the British Parliament kind of sit a president of the treaty, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting point that most historians don't realize. And that's defending it and just stating what it is. And I contend, yeah. Yeah. I contend that uh, Collins himself personally that he knew early on in the negotiations, or certainly before they were, were, were well concluded, that what was an offer is all they're going to get now for the time being oh, yes. from the British Empire. But being a pragmatist, he said, we'll go back to Dolly or to the legitimate Dahl, we'll get this ratified, and we can take care of the North in our own time then when the, when the dust has settled. I think that was his pragmatic thinking because I think they didn't want any more Irish killing Irish, you know, or anything like that. So no, therefore, no, no, when no, no, no. The, the tragedy to me is this. Huh? Yes, the, tra the tragedy to me is this. If, if, if De Valera was a true statesman and had the Irish cause at heart, truly had it at heart, the Dáil would have ratified that treaty as it did. He did, they walked out of the Dáil. They would not accept the vote of Dáil Éireann. And he said, we'll put it to the people. They had, as you know, a plebiscite, a referendum for the people, and they in turn endorsed the treaty. Yes, yes. The, 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 the duplicitous of nature of De Valera was. I think his intent, uh, I, I don't know, many historians don't look at this, and I'm not a historian of any description. I'm an interested participant in our history, is that I think the ultimate goal of De Valera was to get rid of Collins. Yeah. I always believed that. If you look at the vote in the Dáil, when they came home from London, they had to ratify the... Yep. The treaty, they, there was serious, very hot debates. Apparently, there was a few punch-ups, but very hotly debated. And he went to a vote, and Collins and the pro-treaty side won by a, a, a majority of seven, 64 for 57 against. Then De Valera thought he could get around that and uh, call for a referendum. And the referendum was at, at um, a ratio of four to one, over yeah. since the people who voted for the treaty. Is that not an endorsement of the people? Then he came up with that famous speech in March where he would wade through crowds of, of Irish blood 
until he would get his so-called Irish Free yes. Public. Many years later, the he famous ri river, the famous yeah, rivers of blood speech, yeah, yeah, and uh, all these what you call the speeches of incitement to hatred and all of that psyched up guys when guys didn't. But I wanted to make one very, very important point here. Many people ask the question, you know, about the different armed groups. Now, take now when we're in the year, right? We're in our discussion here. We're now in early 1922. We're post-treaty, uh, post-referendum, but pre-Civil War. You got to look at the armed groups that was in Ireland at the time. You still had the British Army in their barracks all over Ireland. You had the IRA who had now come out and taken over some of these barracks. And now the IRA was split between pro-treaty and anti-treaty. The pro-treaty were now calling themselves yes. the Army, while the other guys had named various names of holding on to the IRA name, irregulars, uh, anti-treaty, and other such such names. But you had the biggest armed group of all, which is never been mentioned, and that is basically um, the non-participants, the side of the IRA who never fought, the, the neutral guys, and apparently the biggest amount of people within the IRA were guys who stayed neutral. And famous commanders like Tom Barry, I believe, was one of such these commanders that did want to, as the kind was laid, later phrase, uh, brother against brother, father against son, and uh, uncle against neighbor, and all of that. They did want to fight. And unfortunately, Dan, Dan a, lot of the, a lot of the recruits in the both sides of the Civil War were made up of men who never fought in the War of Independence. That is one of the tragedies of the Civil War, where the real men who did all the work, who got us to where we are, got us not fully, but nearly there, just didn't hmm. have to turn on the... And, so, and well, Michael, believe it or not, on a pragmatic, on a pragmatic note, We've run well over the hour, so there's only one thing to say, and that is we'll have to do a part two on this very soon. So we'll stop it. We'll stop it appropriately at the Rivers of Blood speech. <laughs> Would that yes. be okay? okay. Well, what we can do is we can do part two on the Civil War. Because they... they exactly, they, exactly. So that... Uh, And it's important to state, uh, guys, that that Michael Hassett is, um, you would call him a local historian and many other things as well, but we're delighted to have Michael on board on TV. And as I said, Michael will be hosting this uh, regular program on TV. But for this edition, I think we'll conclude it, Michael, and it was fantastic insight. And I'm looking forward to the to the second part anyway. So from this edition of this program with Michael Hassett as your host, goodbye and good luck. Thank you, Pat. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you.